John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we've just heard Mark's uh, version of the baptism of Jesus, how Mark tells that story. And there were images on the screen. And we also have, there's an art image that's a part of our slide transitions um, in our online worship service. And maybe you have other images of the baptism of Jesus that you call to mind. Um, we hold those images in our mind as we hear about them. And each year when we remember and hear the story of Jesus' baptism, we take time in our service to renew and reaffirm our own baptism and to remember our baptism. So we're gonna do that this morning. I want us to take a few moments and try to remember, visualize our own baptism, visualize your baptism, however you remember it, whether it's an actual physical memory or maybe memories that you have from photographs that you've seen from that day. Maybe you were an infant cradled in the arms of a pastor or a priest a gentle hand cupped full of water and poured over your sweet little head. Or maybe you were older and you were guided to the altar rail, rail where you knelt and cool water was poured over your head and it streamed down your shoulders. Or maybe you waded into one of Florida's chilly springs and were guided under the waters by loving arms you were held as you were submerged and rose up again, drenched. Each baptized Christian has been acknowledged as a member of the same loving family in which Jesus is a beloved son. And at our baptism, promises were made either for us or by us, vows to renounce and reject evil and oppression and to follow in the way of Jesus. Earlier, Millie read from Genesis chapter one, in the beginning, the very first thing that God created was light. God said, let there be light, and there was light. We talked about that light last week, Epiphany Sunday. We talked about Jesus coming into the world and we remembered how in the Gospel of John, it says that in Jesus, in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. In this dark year of pandemic and division and conflict, and in a year when our eyes have been opened to our racism and white supremacy, we need Jesus' light even more. We are to let that light shine in and through us, and in doing that, we lead others to the light. 
the light source. We lead them to Jesus. After creating the light, God separated the light from the darkness. Our bishop, Bishop Ken Carter, speaking in response to the events in Washington, D.C. this week, said, as followers of Jesus who have been through the waters of baptism, we are in a moment when we will need to separate the light from the darkness, to articulate who we are and who we are not. And this is actually what happens when we are baptized. It happens through the vows that we make and reaffirm. Those vows, well, one of them says, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world and repent of your sin? And we respond, I do. So say, I do. Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world and repent of your sin? I do. Do. We renounce our sin in order to receive something greater, and that something greater is Jesus. We vow, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? We respond with, I do. Say, I do. We confess Jesus Christ as our Savior. This is how we separate the light from the darkness. We renounce, we reject, and then we confess Christ as our Savior. And that's how we articulate who we are and who we are not how we become part of the body of Christ. This is a time to separate light from darkness. We are surrounded by people in our world today who are full of rage and anger, who profess hatred towards others. We, you and I, cannot do much about what other people do, people who stir the world into a frenzy. We cannot stop them from saying the things that they say. But we can do our best not to add to the hatred and the violence. And we can work not to spread the lies and the misinformation. We can do our best to name evil, injustice, and oppression when we see it. And folks, we saw it this week in Washington. Desecration and destruction. We saw symbols of hatred and of our harmful past. We saw the reality of unequal treatment between white persons and black and brown persons. I am a white Christian. And as a white Christian, I cannot not see what is right in front of me. And I cannot not see, as a Christian who has, was born and has lived and raised in the South, I cannot not see the horror and the terror of Wednesday's raid in Washington, D.C. At our baptism, promises were made either for us or by us, vows to renounce and reject evil and oppression and to follow in the way of Jesus. Following the way of Jesus. That's discipleship. This is our call to discipleship. Our call to live our discipleship. To live into those baptismal vows. And right now, in these days, anti-racism is our discipleship. I want to show a few minutes of a clip from Bishop Carter speaking on Thursday uh, related to the events in Washington, and um, he has some good words. I would commend the whole uh, talk to you, but let's just hear a couple of minutes of what he has to say. They say preachers preach to themselves. I'm preaching to myself. I've lived in the South almost my whole life, except for a little bit of time in Princeton, New Jersey, which was a very segregated place. 
And I became comfortable with all of these symbols, these segregationist symbols, these racist symbols around us and practices. I grew complacent in that. That's my own work of anti-racism. Anti-racism, as I have said right now, is discipleship. Anti-racism is sanctification. It is social holiness. It's not something we do with this committee over here. It's not the news flash of the moment. It's deeply embedded in our nation, in the history of our church, whether that's the Baptist church or the Presbyterian church or the Methodist church or the Episcopal church. Uh, it's, it's deeply embedded in most of us, myself. So I want to encourage you to stay with this. And when you think about praying about this, yesterday I was praying for Bishop Easterling, Latrell Easterling colleague in D.C. and some pastors I knew in D.C. So we, we definitely pray for the protection of people. Uh, but as we pray for this, we, we, we sit there and we pray like the psalmist prayed. Uh, and we say, see if there's any sin or evil in me. Root it out. I use my, me language, I language, we language. Um, so we say, let's pray about this. Um, prayer is staying with the evil of it until it begins to do something in us that makes us different. And friends, that's, that's what conversion is. And across our lifetime, we need many conversions. Conversion is not something that happened to me when I was 19 years old and walked down an aisle of a church. Uh, I find that I need conversions throughout my lives. And sometimes uh, those conversions happen uh, in a moment like this. Doesn't mean one person, I'm better than you or more enlightened than you. It means I am sensing this may be a conversion moment for our church. Anti-racism is our discipleship. A part of our work as disciples is dismantling unjust systems and building beloved community. We may not remember details of our baptism, but we know. The knowing is in us and fills us. The Holy Spirit reminds us. We are God's beloved and we have work to do. Another one of our baptismal vows says, as members of the body of Christ, do you accept the freedom and power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? And we say, I do. I do. We have the power to change. We accept the power that God gives us to grow, to learn, to see. So I start with myself and I call you to see, to really see and to begin with yourself. Accept the freedom and the power that God gives you and let's do the work, the work of anti-racism. Let's pray together. Oh God, these are terrible days, challenging days, and days when we cannot sit back and watch and wait and wonder on the sidelines, but you call us to see and to act, to do something. And that work, that important work begins with our very selves. It begins with having our eyes opened to the reality of white supremacy and racism 
in me, in myself. At the end of Psalm 139, the psalmist says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. See if there is any wicked way in me. And that's really our call, is to have the images set before us, um, remind us, chasten us, and call us to do the work of anti-racism, the work that is our discipleship. And God, I pray that we would accept the power that you give us to change. And as Bishop Carter says, may it be a conversion moment for us and for our church. And God, as your beloved sons and daughters, we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. And we pray saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.